All right, there's a few people outside still, but we'll get started here. Uh, our next speaker today is Mark Mendelschmidt. He's a BioXFL STC scientist and visiting scientist at DAISY, uh, the European XFL. Uh, he will be discussing some of the unique features that we can expect to see uh, from the European XFL once that's online. Okay. Thanks, Yep. Yeah, so I'll talk mainly about the SPVSFX instrument, but uh, of course also give, give a general introduction into the European X file for, uh, I'm sure we yeah, understand best here, um, for whoever might not know all the details yet. Um, this is how the facility looked uh, uh, quite some time ago, uh, and it all was still construction uh, by now. Most of it is, is nice and green uh, and uh, the buildings that are kind of, of half finished here uh, are pretty much all done. Uh, in fact, today was supposed to be my first work day uh, in this. Oops, there. So, wow. In this building here, uh, the the whole company literally moved out of our old premises on Thursday. Uh, they gave us the Fridays Friday off and moved all the boxes. Well, almost all the boxes because I got a few emails of people missing boxes uh, into into this place. So uh, by the time I'm back from Buffalo, hopefully all the boxes have been sorted out and everybody is now together uh, in one building, uh, a whole 250, 280 or so people uh, that that are not part of DAISY, so that are not part of the accelerator, uh, will be there. The experimental hall, as you will we'll see later is, is right below here uh, and is not quite finished inside, but uh, there's, there's a lot in already. Um, we're actually not in Hamburg anymore. Um, <laughs> the, this year is uh, Schönefeld and I believe right around here is the city border and everything from there is the city of Hamburg. Uh, but uh, Funnily enough, also means that the accelerator pretty much ends up here. So, so the accelerator switching of the <laughs> electrons still happens in Hamburg. Um, and pretty much uh, everything that generates light uh, is in Schönefeld. Uh, and most notably, the experimental facilities are in Schönefeld. Uh, but this is also the, the city border of Hamburg, so we are not, not really far. You, you can walk in five minutes from, from the city. But it's important because the bus services uh, sort of still still go to there, and it being Germany, you do need a bus to get there. Um, we also have pretty much no parking. Uh, the parking situation didn't didn't change from this picture. Um, yeah, in almost more than European uh, facility uh, because Russia contributed a lot, and China is also very interested. Uh, India uh, wants to participate as well uh, at some point, so it's it's not not that very European anymore. It's it's truly an international organization with with also people coming, of course, from all over the world contributing to it. Uh, it's a bit more than than half of the money comes from Germany, and a bit more than half of the people come from Germany. Um, the second big contributor is, is Russia. Uh, without that contribution, uh, the, the facility couldn't be uh, standing as it is. Uh, a lot of the contribution actually comes in material. For example, Russia builds, builds a lot of the vacuum, uh, not vessels, but, but mainly transport that we get. And uh, all kinds of, of countries contribute with, with a lot of intellectual uh, property and actually assembling things. The accelerators that we have uh, go um, from Germany, I think, to Poland and to France and then uh, back to Germany for the final installation. The, the undulators do, do a few other countries and a and similar round trip. Uh, many things are, are assembled in one place and, and then everything ends up in, in Hamburg. But, it makes this uh, a pretty interesting thing and involves uh, a lot of people that, of course, are, are very willing to contribute. Many, many institutions that have uh, a lot of shareholders in there. Uh, so this is basically impossible for me to, to give credit to everybody that's in there. Um, DAISY is 
the, the largest shareholder, basically holding the, the German contribution. It, it all flows through Daisy. European Exfil itself is its own company, but is important for, for all kinds of legal reasons. Most importantly, for people not paying tax at this facility. So, I mean, the facility for buying stuff, uh, all the employees, of course, have to pay tax. Um, Daisy also was, was really the stakeholder for the many, many years uh, before the former known Tesla project uh, evolved into the European Exfil. Um, and so uh, all the primary designs uh, originated at DAISY at some point. Um, by now, everything, essentially X-rays, comes from the European XFL uh, company. A, a lot of former DAISY employees, but they are all now European XFL employees uh, and all sit in the new building. And pretty much the whole accelerator business is, is still run by DAISY, will be operated by DAISY for the foreseeable future and uh, starts at DAISY, the people sit at DAISY, they, they have their own meetings. Um, so far, we, we live very close to them and, and we, we join these meetings. Uh, we'll, we'll see in the next months how we work it out so that, that we don't actually separate the facility that no one wants, um, even though we are uh, like half an hour or so uh, apart now. But I'm sure we, we make that happen. Um, this, this is another fancy view on, on how the whole thing looks because everything is essentially underground. There's, there's lots of uh, living spaces all uh, in, in the Hamburg part, basically, of, of the whole thing. Uh, the, the whole Schönefeld site uh, used to be uh, essentially fields and, and a bit of a nature preserve, but made it a similar problem to, to the Swiss project. So, so all these ponds here are uh, not, not necessary for the facility. They are necessary for the amphibians because we had to restructure uh, that preserved landscape uh, of, of a cultural landschaft. So it's uh, the nature preserve for, for fields being developed in the olden times in Germany. Uh, it's a Bit of a strange concept, but uh, because we built something on there that, that now clearly isn't a field, we, we had to uh, recover some of it. And there's there's actually a funny little little river uh, called a, a Wiesenfluss, so, so 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 field creek that that's flowing essentially through the facility and, and ending up in, in one of these things. So it's all all very wet and uh, I live very close. There's truly a lot of amphibians around there. So, so there, there, there's real nature. Um, there, are, there are some deer, but we have a big fence. So I think our deer will not cross. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so first users are frogs rather than, than deer. Um, that's, that's a view into the Barnfeld campus uh, where the accelerator starts. Uh, there's, there's really a tiny building on the top, that's, that's pretty much the only thing you see and everything goes underground. Uh, at that point, I think uh, 30 meters, um, just as it is in, in the headquarters, so, so everything experimental is, is quite a few floors down here. In between uh, the facility, because of the landscape, is just 10 meters underground, um, going under, under pastures and buildings and everything. Uh, according to German law, uh, that anyhow belongs to the country. So you, you own your house and a few meters below it, but if someone wants to build a tunnel below you, it's, it's not your business. Um, this is where the, the electrons uh, get, get distributed. Uh, also the last piece that, that is actually in, in Hamburg. Um, and <clears throat> then the undulators uh, come in Schoenefeld and split up in uh, a few tunnels that, that serve the different experimental stations. Uh, currently, uh, only three of them are actually filled with undulators, um, as you will see in the next slide. Uh, this is a bit more schematic representation, but we have all these tunnels exist. Um, also, this, this electron beam dump exists, so the transport to get the electron beam through here. Uh, is completely built. Um, only the orange lines, um, the three, so SARS-1, oops, can't stand there, SARS-3 and SARS-2, 
um, are there as undulators. Uh, so we have two full slots in the experimental hall that are literally free uh, to be occupied by whatever turns out to be the next best science beside the instruments that we built already. Um, and we have two spaces for undulators. Uh, the, the way the facility goes, whenever you have a bend, you obviously share the beam. The, the idea is like it is already with SARS-1 and SARS-3. You produce lasing uh, at hard X-rays first. Um, that doesn't spoil the beam very much. So you can bend it away and then produce uh, soft X-rays with the very same beam later on. So both of these undulators can, can have the full rate uh, of pulses simultaneously, while if the beam goes here, then uh, the beams need to be shared. So all the pulses uh, can go either here or there. Um, it should also be possible to switch off lasing for part of the pulse train if uh, the lasing itself disrupts the beam too much. Uh, so you can kick the beam just ever so slightly um, in the middle of the train and then uh, that part doesn't lace here and supposedly you can compensate if you are clever enough with the second kick that this beam is then all right for 4003 and, and so you have a fresh electron beam that lases. Uh, altogether it serves six instruments that uh, are here. So uh, we have one basically SPVSFX where, where I will say a lot about in, in the following slides, um, everything biology, we have a materials imaging and dynamics beam line, uh, of course, uh, a station dedicated to just time resolved studies and a high energy den density physics station for the hard x-rays and for the soft x-rays, um, pretty much an equivalent of, of all these uh, minus the high energy density science uh, just put into two uh, stations, one more for spectroscopy and coherent scattering, and the other ones for basically atomic and molecular physics. Um, very much mapping up with, with what LCLS has in experiments, uh, a similar facility doing, doing similar science to start off with. Uh, but as I say, we, I mean, this is three undulators. We have two more undulator slots and therefore uh, four more instrumental stations uh, that, that are ready to be taken up uh, for whenever someone finds the funding. Um, uh, here map uh, where we stand on the international competition as, as we see it. We are clearly the highest energy machine uh, that is around. Uh, LCLS2 gets, gets kind of close, but we probably have, have quite a bit of uh, energy to spare, given that, that our modules seem to work very well. Uh, that gets us uh, very comfortably in, into the hard energy range. Uh, we have tunable undulators, uh, so we are essentially limited by our offset mirrors. Uh, we could push the machine further. Um, we had to choose how far we go, and, and that's uh, essentially uh, 25 kV, but with just changing the angles or exchanging the mirrors, uh, in principle, for I mean, very low cost, this could be extended any time. Um, clearly also the, the highest uh, average flux, because uh, we have 27 kilohertz pulses, this uh, a bit odd-shaped uh, trains, uh, so these distribute in, in just 10 pulse trains for the start uh, with 2700 pulses uh, at four and a half megahertz repetition rate within the pulse train. Um, that is apparently not a super hard number. Uh, there are ways that the accelerator people think about to extend the pulse trains and then you would lower the, the rate within the pulse train and have uh, more even a distribution um, to get a, a true CW source like, like LCLS2 is planning, uh, it would need a substantial upgrade. But uh, the four and a half megahertz is, is not, not a hard number. Um, the data first beam is by now an electron beam, it seems, in 2016. Um, we unfortunately will probably push it to next year, as you will see more 
Um, before I go into the details of the experiment, uh, I wanted to, to mention the, the whole team. Uh, this is all the different uh, contributions. Uh, we actually have a person from the sample environment group um, that, that really is pretty much dedicated to the, the instrument that is in our group meetings and that we sort of cross-check everything with so that uh, the sample environment fits in, in the chamber. So, so sample environment doesn't include the chamber. The chamber comes from the instrument. Everything in the chamber comes from this group. Um, and I'll say a few more things there. Uh, most notably, uh, Adrian is, is leading the whole effort uh, and, and holds it all together uh, and makes sure that we have enough fun while, while doing the work. Uh, does, does a great job in that. Um, that's where the instrument sits. Uh, two mirrors, two mirror systems with, with actually four mirrors in here to produce a micro-sized focus very close, I mean, in the tunnel, very close to the experimental chamber. Uh, in nanometer focus system, then the chamber, a detector, uh, then a refocusing, what you don't see, and a second detector here. Um, um, I will first go through the, the whole experiment, but, but the real focus is what can we do on day one, because as you will see in a few slides, uh, it's a lot of time to write proposals, um, but I can't talk about uh, all the little details. Uh, the, the second part, of the beamline is uh, funding wise uh, completely supported by the SFX user consortium. But it's one beamline, there's, there's no wall, we, we do everything together. We plan to use the same detectors with uh, the difference of the second one being four times the size of the first one. And obviously, just the first one being there in, in the very beginning because these things are development projects, so it takes a while to. Get on going. Um, the science we want to do uh, imaging is is still our poster child, but uh, there's certainly crystallography uh, coming right after that. Uh, I don't think I have to, to say much uh, about it. Uh, imaging probably done with aerosol injectors, and then we need to fight hits, and uh, they need to fit on the detectors uh, just as LCLS. We have a hole in our first detector, uh, and then a second detector actually many, many meters behind that. Um, eventually, as I said in the beginning, we don't have the second detector, but uh, we should be able to do uh, a very decent uh, sex vex combined experiment because we have four megapixels uh, eventually uh, for sex uh, and, and a megapixel for vex. Uh, so that, that should be sufficient for everything that one can imagine there. Um, as it goes with imaging, you need a very high dynamic range on the outside of, of our uh, high resolution detector. We expect something like 10 to the minus 3 photons per pixel. On the inside, we expect something like 10 to the 4 photons per pixel. Um, and hopefully, our detector will do this with the gain switching that they have in there. Um, we of course, to crystallography and always, and we saw uh, much more detail uh, about this from Uvori, so no reason to say anything. Uh, all of this can do in Pump Pro in, in both stations um, because I'm not a laser guy, and our laser uh, having to run like the machine at 4.5 megahertz is, is rather evolved and, and takes uh, even me half an hour to talk about. Uh, <laughs> I, I basically skip this, but I uh, want to assure you that, that we can do Pump Pro at the full pulse rate uh, with short and, and long lasers with sufficient energy uh, is, is everything uh, I describe. Um, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, at some point, it was decided that uh, the energy needs to be limited. Uh, so we picked 3 to 16 kV. Uh, the detector, therefore, can uh, really detect single photons at, at 3 kV already. So you can do very soft experiments, uh, especially for imaging, that's probably uh, important. Uh, 
the can go up to 16 kV only because of the mirrors. Um, you run out of mirror lengths with, with the size of beam that we expect. Um, if the beam actually gets smaller, it would be very easy because this is coded mirrors already to put a different coating on it and extend that range slightly. Probably 20 kV is, is done I mean, somewhat easily. Um, everything more would be difficult. Um, so I mentioned micron and 100 nanometers here. Mirrors, we uh, don't have a monochromator at all. We don't even really have space for a monochromator uh, for the downstream experiment. There's lots of space in between the experiment to put one in for the upstream. It's very difficult to imagine. We basically hope that we can tune the machine to get a bandwidth out that people want to have. Uh, and there's the other experiments. If one really needs to do a monochromatic experiment, but doesn't seem to be necessary for biology, um, there are stations with monochromators at the facility. Um, I'll say more about the high dynamic range of the detector later. Um, and because we are very high pulse energy source, uh, we did everything we could to, to get the highest pulse energy also to the sample. Um, doesn't work so well at 3 kV because even our one meter mirrors are a bit short, most likely, for, for the beam size that we expect uh, because we are uh, several hundred meters uh, after the undulator uh, because people are more worried to burn the mirrors than, than they are to capture the beam. So it's a it's a trade-off we make there. Um, we, we choose mainly to have, have mirrors uh, to uh, maintain the highest quality wavefront. We do also use beryllium lenses and in fact we start with beryllium lenses. Um, we, we try to be full train rate compatible um, for the primary uh, instrumentation we are. Most likely for the beryllium lenses we are not. Uh, just because even beryllium gets damaged at some point and since we use them for refocusing they, they actually get uh, in some conditions a, a rather small beam already. Uh, not being full train compatible means we limit the machine. We tell uh, the accelerator that we want pulse trains with only a few hundred pulses uh, and not this 2700. Um, in pretty much all uh, modes that we currently foresee, we should be fine to fill um, the detector that, that has a limited uh, range of, of pulses at 352 um, per pulse train and we should be able to get very close to fill that in essentially all uh, conditions so it doesn't really limit us. Pulse durations, we definitely can uh, do 10 to 100 femtoseconds from the machine, we might be able to uh, produce longer pulses uh, pretty much for sure and shorter pulses most likely too. You just don't know how much energy will be in them and uh, well, the beam should be spatially coherent uh, or we don't have a laser and as I already said we, we are a long way um, from, from the undulator. Um, but there's some benefits. We, we have plenty of space uh, in between where anything that would be strange coming from somewhere close to the undulator should be cleaned up. Uh, more than 200 meters from us is, is the first set of distribution mirrors, so they are still far away from us, but, but there's, there's a lot of experimental benefits. Um, and this table we essentially saw uh, the important part earlier already. That's how it looks on the schematic. Uh, very long undulator, um, the horizontal offset mirrors, as I said, uh, with more than 200 meters away from us. We decided to have uh, a four bound system to keep the beam going with the same angle that it had before for the micron focus because this is 27 meters away. And so at the mirror angle, um, the only other option would have been to have two focusing ellipses and then move the experiment by really a long way away. Um, to not do this, we, uh, we have a flat and a focusing mirror uh, together. Um, if we go to 100 nanometers, we have to be much closer and, and therefore it's just one pair is there. Uh, as already mentioned, there's a refocusing system that we can do two experiments at the same time. 
uh, mainly for crystallography, most likely uh, for imaging, uh, we might actually need those detectors, as I already say, we have a very extensive uh, beam diagnostic section um, after both experiments so that we can always uh, measure uh, in the direct beam uh, but whatever we want to see there, there. There should be a wavefront sensor in here, there should be a spectrometer uh, that is single shot capable, so hopefully uh, we can tell everything about the beam uh, on, on every single shot. Um, and yeah, the detectors um, hopefully are, are agent detectors. We don't have any of them other than little test modules on our hand right now. If they don't come on day one, uh, we'll have alternatives. Uh, most likely also coming from Switzerland. So. <laughs> um, they, there will be two interaction regions, of course, with the two detectors. If we refocus, uh, they can both run with sample jets. And uh, the two chambers are uh, quite a bit different because uh, this detector is really big. Uh, it actually comes with an 800 millimeter gate valve. But this is kind of small. It only has a half meter gate valve. Um, and, and so they look a bit different. But in terms of, of sample and sample environment, uh, you can basically plug all these, these modules in, in both places. And uh, of course, to stereocrystallography, we don't imagine doing Korean imaging in the second region, but, but really just, I mean, first of all, the, the nonfocus focus only exists up front. And second, uh, the Korean imaging probably doesn't work so well with the beryllium like this. Um, so that's the only way to get the beam to the downstream and action region. Uh, as I already say, pump probe is everywhere possible as well. Uh, yeah, and the second part is, is part of the SFX contribution. Um, we have CLs. Uh, I don't want to go into the details. That's how our unit uh, will look like uh, with, with all the motion uh, all the lenses. Uh, you have a certain number of stacks on each arm, and then you can combine them and essentially adjust your focus um, over the full energy range. Uh, Patrick is the guy that did all the calculations and took care of it, and Luis is the associated uh, engineer within the European x uh, The unit comes from JJ X-Ray, the lenses come from RX Optics. And um, we will start with that, uh, and uh, I'm most likely, unless the, the mirrors show up from Japan uh, earlier than, than currently, anticipated and, and we should get uh, one by one focus. Oops. Let's see. Uh, and we, in fact, uh, have the lenses. Uh, we don't quite have the mechanics yet, uh, but I've been three weeks ago, I think, at JJ X-Ray and seen the chamber and the motors. Uh, it needs a bit of putting together at the company, but we are, we are pretty confident that like, within the next few months we'll get this unit and we're actually not ready to uh, really use it yet. So, so this, this is all uh, well in time of, of when we need it. Uh, we did our homework and simulated uh, how all the beam will look like um, in an ideal situation, this is what we expect in, in the beam divergence. Even if the beam divergence gets, gets twice as big as, as we think, we start seeing aberrations, but we should be in our right uh, way. And no one thinks that the beam will be actually this big, uh, but eventually the, the offset mirrors will clip it and, and the lenses will focus some of that. So um, we wouldn't work with this beam, we would put apertures in to clean this up a bit. Um, it uh, will be a bit difficult because we don't have apertures that are useful for this uh, before these lenses, so we would have to clean up after that and, and cut into it, but let's say that I mean, no one expects the beam to be this big. Um, the lenses are, of course, uh, in, in solid numbers. Uh, this is where we believe we will start an energy and the, the 100 EV difference between them is about what the machine is, is confident right now in telling us they will be able to deliver. Um, 
it's most likely that they can actually tune the energy, but for now they, they don't want to commit to this, so we might have to tune our lenses, and uh, so we, we might be um, something like, like a meter out of focus in the beginning if we really hit the energy that's, that's, that's right, I mean, hit the distance that's right in between, uh, because uh, all these all these numbers scale relative to one another, but if the divergence uh, moves a bit, then, then our experiment will just not sit at the right position. Um, but uh, as you see, I mean, we are uh, 26 meters away from the focus, um, and, and the, the distances don't, don't change much, so we don't believe we are in trouble, even if we are ending up right in the middle. And, and if we would be in trouble, then the machine would surely adjust the energy. Um, the mirrors uh, should be nice, they're all a meter long, they all come from JTEC, and because these come from JTEC and, and our offset mirrors also come from JTEC, uh, the Japanese are very busy and uh, probably can't deliver our mirrors so much ahead of time that we have enough time to pump them down um, and be confident to put the first beam on there when it comes. Uh, the, the whole mechanics come from FMB Oxford and, and are, are pretty well advanced, so, so you're not worried about that part, it's, it's only about getting the mirrors in. Uh, they operate over, over the full range and they do so by two different coatings, so there's a boron carbide on there and the ruthenium. Um, as I mentioned, uh, one, one PS is 400 nanometers, four mirrors are for the one micron, um, very, very tight specs, uh, two nanometers. Height error uh, is allowed, and uh, they're on their way. Um, the, the details uh, you only get from JTEC. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to get get an accurate uh, statement from them. But but currently is there. Since we want to start with the one micron beam, uh, we need four mirrors before we have anything. And uh, it's we probably have some, but we probably don't have four. Um, but we have a full design, uh, has two, two big iron pumps on, on uh, each uh, pair of mirrors. Um, so essentially, uh, we, we have three of these chambers, uh, the nano chamber for the mirrors looks, looks very alike, and then has uh, the two nanometer cross mirrors on there. Uh, for the one micron, uh, this pair would be either the horizontal or the vertical mirrors. Uh, and it's uh, our standard concept and an outside frame, this metal, uh, the whole hutch basically will, will, will look like this. You, you have a metal frame holding the chamber and you have the mirrors sitting on the granite that's in between, they're not connected with one another. So any pumping you do on the chamber, the mirrors hopefully will never see and therefore they won't vibrate. Um, very different to uh, LCLS where try to put everything on, on the big granite and, and stabilize everything. Um, this is the timeline. Uh, besides the mirrors being uh, produced, uh, they also need to be coated and need to go to metrology. That, that adds a bit of time as well. And as you see, we have the January, March time frame. And as you go here in, in a bit, uh, that's not really working. This is our expected first beam. Uh, because uh, the users, especially all the biologists, want to put a lot of sample in, uh, we actually installed um, a three-stage uh, differential pumping unit between our uh, nanometer KBs um, and the chamber, and we tested this already, um, actually twice. Uh, this was the very first prototype here. Uh, you see we can establish a very reasonable uh, differential. Um, this would go to the mirror tank. It's not quite where we wanted it at, at four to the minus eight, and we saw too much bleeding. So our final design actually has uh, a changeable diameter insert of boron carbide uh, differential pumping straws, uh, and we, we tested five millimeter currently. And at five millimeter, we have a small nine scale leak. If the chamber sits, I mean, very comfortably in, in the middle of the ten to the minus four. That's basically the worst we've ever seen at LCLS, and we're still able to run. Um, these straws are um, exchangeable and variable diameters, so that if there's someone coming that, that needs to 
needs to do sort of a various experiment where, where there's much more gas going into the chamber. Uh, we would need to spend more time aligning this differential pump um, because the straws would get very close to the beam size. Uh, but it certainly would be possible uh, this, without getting ever any gas in there. Uh, we do have uh, window valves with, with diamond in there, but as LCLS has shown, uh, for imaging purposes, they, they have uh, detrimental scattering. Uh, so we, we certainly want to keep the option open to have uh, in, in windowless vacuum. There's also going to be a fast valve integrated in the section. So if the chamber has some bad vacuum event, uh, we should within a tenth of a second close the valve here. So for the very same reason, I never get any dirt on the mirrors. Um, and basically all of this is, is by now tested. Uh, we, we see very minimal, but some delay in, in the differential pump unit between uh, there, there being uh, an opening of the valve essentially to, to something like a millibar on this side and uh, something showing up on the gauge on the other side. Uh, the delay is below a second, but it seems visible. And this tenth of a second, we, we certainly have a chance to, to not have anything bad happening. Uh, sample chamber also comes from FMB Oxford, uh, but uh, they, it was all freely awarded, but FMB Oxford uh, managed to put nice packages together and, and sort of win, win the bidding process every single time. But uh, it's really nice because this way, um, a lot of components will definitely fit together because the same company produces them, so they have all the drawings already without us working anything. Uh, lots, lots of holes in, in the chamber. Um, of big one for, for pumping here. Uh, the injector goes in here. Uh, beam travels through the middle hole through here. Uh, that's the big gate valve for the detector. Uh, that's how it looks from, from the button. So this is the catcher pump. Um, as there's various parts uh, here on the side and, and on top where all kinds of feeds with some cables can come through. All the weirdly angled flanges look, of course, uh, directly at the interaction zoom, zone. So you, you can hopefully point enough uh, cameras in there. Uh, has a very big window uh, for the laser incoupling, uh, giving us hopefully enough freedom to do anything. This is the fast laser that we want. Um, and uh, it's all right on track. Uh, it's the, the contracts are signed. Uh, the design is, is finalized since a few weeks. Um, so we didn't quite hold the April date, but I believe it's still gonna make it to us easily this year. And, this chamber is constructed to uh, pump down quickly because we uh, plan on venting it during the experiment, so uh, we shouldn't be in trouble there. Um, this is our sample environment group. Uh, they uh, provided everything around. The jets actually come, come from uh, the experts uh, surrounding us, a uh, liquid jet uh, from the Max Planck, from the Schlichtings group, uh, but of course it can also take all kinds of other jets. Uh, Henry already has purchased the unit from Uber, so, so an LCP jet is certainly there, and, and uh, well, it'll be integrated even though it doesn't need much much integration work, so it basically fits in there. Um, with Uppsala being on board, we hope to get access to, to the latest and greatest aerosol jet. Uh, fixed targets we, we do in-house, uh, so within uh, Jochen's group, and uh, we have all kinds of like, diagnostics. There will be two cameras around it. There are uh, probably is a third camera in some of the jets. Um, one, one is nice in line with, with the whole, uh, basically the usual thing to, to see what we're doing. That's how it should look uh, in the chamber uh, here, including the, the laser in coupling. Uh, the, the standard design, this is a shroud. Uh, the only difference is this is a bit uh, bigger and more modular, so you can, can actually detach it here and on the button. It's held with an hexapod, so we move things uh, in a bit of different way, but uh, 
essentially it's the same a small entrance aperture uh, and, and a large scattering cone that uh, is actually designed to be bigger than, than the detector uh, can come close so it, it shouldn't shadow any diffraction if you align things properly and already for day one uh, we have a rather large bridge that holds everything from the sample chamber uh, all the way to, to the end of, of the whole thing. The beryllium lenses uh, in the middle for refocusing have, have an additional uh, granite stand in the middle. So if, if everything works out and everything is stable, they get mounted on the reel. Uh, if the reel isn't stable enough, we just mount them uh, on, on the big granite block that is below. Um, the idea of the reel, of course, is that these mirror angles can change and everything groups together. Um, just like the mirrors, uh, actually the inside of the sample chamber is, is held on feet that go uh, through the vacuum for ultimate stability. Uh, so while the chamber moves and therefore all vacuum connections move, move in line with the reel, um, nothing changes to the sample. Uh, and, uh, it doesn't move around, right? Uh, we believe is key for, for the imaging with, with like micrometer beams uh, as well as uh, for uh, CRLs if they should vibrate because it's, if they vibrate the beam is moving by the, with their vibration and with it being uh, only a micrometer beam uh, we could easily see some problems coming there. Um, it's of course, since it holds the sample chamber, essential for, for our first operation, but again, uh, contracts are out and uh, it's the same company, so we believe they can do it and they'll deliver it on time. Um, detector, um, uh, a bigger team now. Uh, all but Yola are from our team, so uh, again, and Klaus, Stefan, and uh, Stefan, uh, Stefan and Stefan. Uh, <laughs> Everybody else in the group does it wrong, so I do it now too. Uh, we'll start with a one megapixel Egypt. Um, that is a rather big block, the, so most of the electronics find out to the side. We, we can adjust the distance of it. We can only get uh, close to something like about 14 centimeters uh, because it's, it's all rather big and, and, and bulky, but it's big enough to, to still give essentially the same resolution than what, what people currently are able to measure at CXI. Uh, and later on, we will hopefully have uh, a 4 megapixel version uh, that is similar to it. Uh, it's actually constructed differently. So this is uh, very much like uh, the CS pad at CXI right now, built from quadrants, while this is two halves that are built by uh, large vertical blocks uh, that actually can be pulled out from the detector and replaced one by one, but here you would have to uh, take whole quadrants out um, just because it's bigger and, and, and access is different. I mean, this, as I say, this gate valve here is, is 800 millimeters, so uh, you have space to, to reach in. Uh, and it, it comes from, from Heinz Kraftzwa and uh, a bit more than just these two people that, that developed it. Um, Test models are there, uh, are functioning, see x-rays, um, they actually even work at uh, 6.5 megahertz from, from what I know, they tested them uh, at Petra, uh, 6.5 megahertz because that's, that's the Petra rep rate in a special mode. Um, it's faster than the European x files so we shouldn't, shouldn't have any, any trouble with them. Um, no one believes that they arrive in August, but they should arrive this year. Um, that's why it's blink. <laughs> Uh, we of course need a lot of cables, um, they will come this fall uh, if, if everything is, is alright, but uh, we should have enough time <laughs> to buy it up before we need it. Uh, and we even thought about data analysis, which <laughs> is unfortunately my task, uh, or, or fortunately, uh, it's, it's actually a lot of fun. We, we built our own system, uh, we did some tests and it all looks good, I mean we have like uh, Within a quarter of a second, with the technology we have in the background, uh, we, we can analyze 100 LCLS frames and, and find hits in a, in a reasonable fashion. Um, with, with really getting getting to lysosine data, um, I'm at something like 0 0.06 uh, 
seconds for a single frame. Um, the whole framework Caribou is is spreading it over as many hosts as I like. So um, within a second, you should know what you collected uh, for a fraction of the data. Um, the one thing that uh, is probably uh, also necessary, but uh, is, is coming from the detector group, there's, there's a whole calibration uh, pipeline developed by the detector group and, and already tested and working uh, on the single module level that um, uses GPU uh, algorithms and um, essentially does something like a quarter of the data um, in, in real time on, on a fairly moderate size. So, so online monitoring should be possible and scaling up this GPUs um, to do it really in real time is, is certainly doable. Um, a lot of uh, money coming from, from all kinds of places for the SFX. Um, we now have our own admin to manage it all. Uh, the catcher comes from CFL, uh, injectors come from everywhere, but uh, certainly the Max Planck liquid jet and the Arizona high viscosity jet are, are there. Um, and uh, somehow the Uppsala uh, is missing here. Um, get a lot of people. Um, Every project that, that adds uh, to it gets some positions, so not everybody is directly European Expo there, uh, but you get good collaboration agreements with, with half of the world, basically. Um, and we are scheduled to start now in 2017. Um, the idea is to reach out to the whole uh, user community and by the time that the call goes out uh, at the end of this year, we, we will have all the details of what we believe is, is going to be there uh, communicated to everybody. Uh, this is how our original schedule looked like and uh, unfortunately we now expect something like March, end of March, maybe like April to see the first blazing. Um, in SARS-1, uh, basically when we see that, uh, we are only a radiation approval away from seeing that beam in the experimental uh, hutch uh, for SCB and FXE, so pump probe experiments and all the biology right at that point. And then it takes us all the way to 2019 to be in full operation. Uh, that's how it's, how it's going to look in terms of user time. So you start, um, it's basically nothing. Uh, in, in 2016 for the users, and then we slowly ramp up this 1,000, 2,000, and then the full 4,000 hours uh, from year to year, starting in 2017. We'll push as much as we can to multiplex uh, and switch the beams around, uh, probably already in 2017. So um, while, while the 1,000 hours is probably a real 1,000 in the 2,000, um, there's actually more experiments than 2,000, and eventually this 4,000 uh, should be multiplied by three because all the three solids should work together. Um, it will be peer reviewed. Uh, three calls are, are already foreseen. Um, SPB, SFX, and FXE are the first ones to start, so, so they are the only one in the first call, and then, then we add the other SARSs as, as they become available. and. They want to commission this with the users, and, and uh, all the details will be in the call. Uh, and the good thing is the accelerator already commissioned the gun since quite a while, and uh, by now they are, they are pretty uh, confident with their parameters because they pretty much ticked most of the boxes already with, with the gun at least. Uh, the full accelerator still needs to cool down before they can show that it's lasing. Uh, and that's how they're gonna, gonna look like. Uh, the basic difference from, from the full specs is we, we start with, with a few bunches. Um, you can do single bunches, um, uh, and up to 60 is currently planned. We might start at low rate, we might start with, with short pulse strains. Uh, it's not quite clear what, what the machine wants to do. Uh, all kinds of parameters will be fixed, so the, the machine will be commissioned to one state, and, and then we stay there. And the early experiments, uh, as pretty much said already, are a bit limited. It's only beryllium lenses, only the upstream unit, uh, but real life beam diagnostic and, and beam viewers and 
should be ready to go. We, we have all the injectors in place, we should have a detector, we have femtosecond lasers, so everything is possible, but that's all a bit smaller effort. Um, and we believe we, we can do pretty much the full scope of experiments. Um, and with that, I'm finishing on a few pictures. Uh, the times so in September, we pretty much had all things already. Uh, the building wasn't quite ready, but it had windows already. Uh, this, this is the last thing in uh, Hamburg and in, in the Ostdorf of Born, so that was pretty much done at that time. By now it's all green as well. Uh, that's how the tunnel looks. Uh, it looks like all the accelerators are, are in and, and ready to go. Not, not quite so. Uh, that's how the undulators fit down the shaft. Uh, there isn't really much space uh, besides them, but all undulators are installed already. Uh, so they, they sit in place and wait for the electron beam to lace. Uh, that's how our experimental hall uh, looks. Uh, this, this here being the SARS-1, this is SARS-2. It's going to be the HD SARS-3. There's a big concrete hall uh, because of their high power laser and it's standing already pretty much all the infrastructure here is there and there it's, it's like half finished so it's, it's so there that's how it looked in January um, because you can still see something through the hall uh, pretty much everything on top here is, is already filled this is how, how our hutches look like this they had some special concrete that's why you see a different different shading here um, it's so I'm quite ready to go, but, but very close. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.